let us pray. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would, in your mercy, be with us now as we hear and receive your word as we continue to study the angels whom you have created. We pray that you would bless us out of faith in you and love toward one another. Your son's holy name we pray. Amen. All right. So we are uh, we are continuing our little uh, our little quest along the way here to uh, uh, to look at the angels. Just got to get my uh, get my stuff together here. All right, that'll do. We'll work on that for a bit. Last last week we kind of uh, uh, we started our discussion of the fallen angels. And um, just as we don't know the precise details of the of when the angels were created, only that they were created. In the same way, um, we do not have precise details of when uh, Satan and and his and his angels uh, rebelled. We know that they rebelled. And that it is sometime between uh, let there be light and now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field. <laughs> so somewhere between one one and three one, we have the uh, we have the creation of the angels and the fall of and the fall of of Satan the serpent. That's kind of what we did last week. We're gonna we're gonna look in a little bit more. Uh, detail at some of these verses, especially Revelation 12, which is probably the most the most detail and, and maybe the least helpful section that it that we have about angels. But before we get to that, um, uh, I'm going to be having you look up verses. So if I could get a couple people to help hand out Bibles, if uh, uh, if anyone does not have the Bible, who needs Bibles here? So people need Bibles. I know. See, I'm trying to get you guys ready for Pastor Meyer, because he, uh, he works more on the Bible than I do. So, uh, so I had to kind of warm up for doing, using the books. He tells me he's going to go truly old school on Bible class, and he's not going to use the projector while he's gone. So you guys are going to have to, it's going to, have to be on your best behavior, or at least it's good to get from. I believe, what is it, Rick, do you remember what he said to do with Jonah? Sure. Jonah. So you're going to do a, a four-week study of Jonah, um, which I think would be very good. Oh. When you have your Bible, open up to Jude. Jude is one chapter, so Jude, verse 6. And then after that, we'll be looking at Revelation. Jude, verse 6. Egyptians, and then 
kind of uh, works its way to the angels. See if I can uh, see if I can make it so that's a little bit more here.
kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And at the same time, we get in other places that Satan and the fallen angels have a, a limited ability to interact with the world. Right? So we get that in numerous places in the scripture, starting with Genesis 3. Um, is there any place in the Old Testament other than Genesis 3, Job, and Daniel, where Satan appears? You should think about that for a minute. Genesis 3 is the fall into sin. Job, which I think we'll look at in just a little bit, Job begins with this eternal court of heaven where God is saying, look at my servant Job, and, and then you've got Satan saying, well, yeah, he's awesome because you give him all this stuff. What would happen if you take it all away? Well, that would be a question. Yeah, well, well, in the New Testament, definitely. But and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking specifically about the birth of Christ. Robert? Is Goliath a stand in for when he gets his head chopped yeah, off that's Jesus? Good, that's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that there are lots of, I'll say, satanic images or pictures of, of Satan. Goliath would certainly be one that would at least be an illusion. Pharaoh. Would be, it would be another one. You're going to get those. But that it's not that Goliath is Satan. Right? So there's a difference. Um, Daniel, somebody mentioned Isaiah. I don't know. It just, it just kind of popped in my head as, a, I think, an interesting question worth exploring along the way there. So, so we have them having some limited interaction with the world. Then it, then it almost... Uh, and, but I, what I can't remember, and that could be because I'm three days from going on vacation, I fully admit that. Um, I can't remember a case, for example, of demon possession in the Old Testament. Whereas we get all kinds of them in the New Testament, in the Gospels. So, so it is almost like with the, with the coming of Christ, with the incarnation, we have, we have Satan kind of exploding, trying, doing everything that he can to up to upheave and upend things. Of course, we have Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness and others. Yes, King. So, who played the music for the king? Kind of like crazy like that in the Old Testament. Well, David, but that music is the one to console him. The music there. So the king wasn't possessed. Well, and, and that's, I, I mean, that says uh, something like, it's, uh, that might be our best example, Tina. I think it says something like vexed with a troubled spirit. I'm not sure if it says evil spirit as a personification, you know, as a person or not. So that's, that, that might be the best example, Saul. Zechariah. Zechariah. What is it? The Lord rebuked you, O Satan. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuked you, O Satan. The Lord chose Israel, Jerusalem, to rebuke you. Okay, so there's a little bit, but definitely not a lot. The most vivid and clear image in the Old Testament of Satan is definitely in Genesis 3. And there, of course, he's never called Satan or the devil. He's called the serpent. Elsewhere in the scriptures, we get the serpent that is the devil. You know, elsewhere we get the kind of those that Im implied line clearly connected, but it's not in Genesis 3 itself. So, so we get this picture of these angels who don't stay in their place but left and are now under chains. That is, they are they are not able, they are not free. That's I mean, that's clearly the point there. Under the under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now we get to we get to this one. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. 
So what's that? Well, and that's first of all talking about the the sulfur fire rain down from heaven. But there's an implication that to rebel against your creation and where God has placed you does not end well. That's kind of the implication of that. Does the likewise referring to the surrounding city or to the angels? Um, that's a good question. Is it the Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding cities? Or is it Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which just like the angels? Hmm. So, 
The woman fled into the wilderness, for she has a place prepared by God. Now, in verse seven and following, we get this uh, we get this description of of the fall of of Satan. Now, war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fall back. But he. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So, <coughs> so here we have this picture of this war that takes place um, in heaven, and Michael, we talked about Michael a little bit a few weeks ago. Um, there are two possible interpretations of Michael here, Michael the archangel, but the word Michael means one who is like God, and, um, and at least more than a few uh, scholars would argue that this is a that this is not referring to an angel that is a created being, but that this is referring to Jesus. I'll, uh, I'll I'll let you muse on that. So you get you get you have a good guy and a bad guy, and they're fighting, okay? <laughs> and the and we get a number of names for this: the dragon, the serpent. Satan, devil, and and there and, and here we get them all as the same. Um, it's interesting that the word dragon and serpent are not identical here, but they are. But clearly, the intent of John is to say we're talking about the one who has rebelled against God and who is seeking to destroy his people, the church, and everything that God does. Okay? That is, uh, that is clearly the picture. Ben? Do we have any uh, idea what the sevens and the tens are? Um, I don't have, um, I don't have any specific point. Where are you looking exactly? Uh, verse 3. No, I don't have any specific okay, when you, when you see Jesus with seven eyes, if he's all seen in the Right, well, I mean, that, that so what is as I said, in, in Revelation, you get a lot of pictures that, um, in the best of circumstances, are weird, um, that are clearly symbolic. And, and, I would, and I would definitely say that this is, that this is giving a picture of some, of some things that we don't see anywhere else in the Bible, okay? A little bit in Daniel. That's about it. Now, what does that what does that tell us? First of all, I would argue that this is that this is for us. This is closer to an impressionist painting than than a nice kind of one to one realism. It just is. And one of the basic, simplest way that we read and interpret the Bible is to say that the Bible interprets itself. So, if I'm going to know what the scriptures teach, then I go to clearer passages in the scriptures in order to explain the unclear passages. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this isn't real clear. Um, and so, when we talk about what we know of Satan, we can look at these verses, but also... I don't think that it is to our benefit to get over caught up in the details. The, the, the key point here is that there is one who, who rebelled against God and his rule, and that he is not alone. There, there are Satan and his angels, plural, right? That he is not alone, and that and that this is under God's final rule. So it is not like, it's not really like this is a, like this is a war where we're uncertain of the outcome. 
but this is describing, you can always think of that, uh, think of that verse from the Greek, um, All Saints Day hymn, you know, and, and when the fight is fierce, the warfare long, you know that verse? Um, here, here on their ears, the distant triumph song, the hearts are brave, the gathered arms are strong. There's this picture of that, that yes, there are times, maybe even lots of times in this life when we are at, when we are struggling, when we are at war, where we feel like we are more in the middle of the war than on the end, on the winning end of the war. Um, I have, uh, uh, I have mentioned and quoted a few times uh, the Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was this uh, Lutheran pastor during World War II that was martyred that was uh, was murdered by the Nazis in mid-April 1945, which is really a terrible time to get killed because, you know, this was almost a year after Normandy. Um, Germany was almost done. And, and so they were at the point where they were simply killing political prisoners left and right in order to erase evidence among other things. And so, you know, you think of, uh, I, I've thought of this often, think of Bonhoeffer sitting in this prison cell hearing rumors of this battle, of the many battles that have gone on, and not knowing really truly that the war was, was, was nearly over. But, uh, uh, but because he's kind of on the outside fringe of this, he's not able to see the whole perspective. That is very much how it is like with the Christian life sometimes. Now, I don't want to give away too much of the sermon, so I'm not going to keep talking about that. But that's, that's kind of the picture that I, that I, I see here. I was ask if there are any questions, but that would be kind of silly to almost ask, because there, sh because there should be lots of questions. Um, so that first verse, where it said one third of the stars, we're talking about one third of the angels? It seems like it. That, that seems the best <laughs> um, that seems the best uh, the best picture is tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast into the earth, so a third of the angels. But again, I I don't think that I would I wouldn't I wouldn't be placing any bets on that. I'll put it that way. That makes sense to me. But um, but this is pretty symbolic language, pretty tough to, to nail down. And it's, and it's a third of what? Isn't even saying no? Right. Oh, right. This is it's just a third. That doesn't mean anything unless you have the actual number along the way. We've already discussed that. All right. So, it, so again, big picture is is we have one who is uh, an angel of God, and, and maybe even one of the chief angels, you know, one of these archangels that rebels against God, particularly against His created order. Uh, and, and I want to get I want to get back to that a little bit more very shortly. So kind of keep that keep that thought in your head that, that what Satan want what Satan is doing is is trying to go outside of where God has created yeah. and say no I want to make my I want to be self creating I want to make my own place and not receive what God is doing. Well, it's uh, it's some. There's some very interesting parallels there, um, and and I think that the the questions about what is created and what is not created, I think, is the interesting the interesting one along there. And so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna Lord willing, we're gonna actually end at Romans one here, but it may take us. It's sort of like a uh, Bruce Caitlin Jenner kind of thing. Well, I, I mean, I think I think that uh, that uh, thank you, Mr. Master of the Obvious. Um, no, I do think that the question, and not and not simply talking about him, but but um, the the question of saying, 
what does it mean to, uh, what part of me is a part of my created, my created being? And what part of me is a part of my fallen nature? And what part of me is, is um, something that, that changes and shifts with, with time and is, and is, and is learned? Because you're, you're sort of talking about is uh, how has God created the world and me specifically. Think about how that first commandment explanation is. I believe that God has made me and all creatures so that, so that it's my relationship to God that God is one who created me. I mean, yes, everyone, but it's my relationship to God that is kind of, kind of at stake there. So we start with that and then say, and what part of me is a part of the fall into sin and my rebellion, you know, and and so so what would I look like without sin? You know, that's that's kind of the question here. And where would my station or place in life be as God has created me? I think that's a really interesting question and not an easy one. For us. And I think that that's what we struggle with a lot in America right now, is that because we, this is your fault, Robert, because we are, we are raised from infancy to believe that, that, that I can be anything that I want to be. Well, and I mean, in America, it certainly has a a love-hate relationship with authority, with the, the concept of authority, not not any particular authority, but just saying, you know, I am in a place in an order, <laughs> and that and that that means that there are people above me and people below me, and that that is not a matter of value or worth, but it is a matter of, of place. You know, I don't really need to argue that my heart is more important than my kidney. You know, I need both. <laughs> and, you know, and, or my lungs, or my liver, or, or whatever. I don't have to make the, make the argument because it's a package deal. And that it only works if it is all there. <clears throat> and so, if I, if I try to pit one part of myself against another part of myself, Nothing good is going to come of it. That's kind of the point. And, and so if that's true um, when it comes to my, my own body, how, and that's also true when it comes to, um, that, when it comes to congregational life, when it comes to family, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to government, and you know, kind of across the board. So if our, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that God has made us so that we actually uh, work together, not apart from each other or independent from each other. You know, there's no children without mothers and fathers. That's kind of how the math works, so to speak. And so I, you can't really argue that one is better or worse than another. That's, that's absurd. Because they are created in order to work together. And that's, and that's very much what you see when you look at the creation of angels and of this fall, is that God creates the world in an order. And a part of, of I, I would argue, a part of Christian wisdom is learning what are the things, what are the things in this life that I am and do that are a part of God's good created order. And what are the things in this life that I am and do that can that are part of sin? And what are the things in this life that can that can ever flow or change? You know, is it a part of the is it a part of of God's created order that um, uh, that I have that I'm this tall? <coughs> okay, I'm willing to grant that. Is it a part of God's created order that I am this much out of weight? Not willing to blame God for that, but um, and, and yet at the same time, this even with my my own imperfections, whether you're you know whether you're talking about appearance or or, you know, or intellect or whatever talents, 
whatever you want to look at it as, um, in any of those cases, it is still who God made you. And to say, I despise what God had made, is to despise God. And I think that that's the, that's the struggle that we have with understanding, I'll, I'll say, order of creation, is, is to recognize, well, you know, I am, I am not perfect. I am, I am riddled with sin. You know, my body is broken. It doesn't work the way that I want to. I want it to, etc. And yet, I still confess that I am fearfully and wonderfully that God has created me and that that is a gift not a curse <laughs> but that is uh, I think a, a big part of what we see in our society in struggling with um, with identity is is to simply say my identity is something that I make for myself. I make my own identity. Nobody else makes it for me. I make my own choices. And so, you know, what are the limits to which that is true? And it is true to some degree, right? I mean, you, every, you make choices every day. You know, you choose what to wear, what to eat, how to, you know, what to drink. I mean, you, everybody makes choices that that kind of shape your identity every day. And that that's not bad. That is, again, that's how God had made us. That's a gift. That's not a bad thing. It's not a curse. That's a gift. Um, but what are the parts of me that, that God has said, this is who you are, and not, you are this and not that? And how do I kind of, where is wisdom in saying I am this and not that? And how does that actually help us as human beings? I, I would argue that it does. Very much so. Um, but why do we struggle with that question? Since we've gone down this rabbit hole, we might as well see if there's anything else. <coughs> Society's embrace of sin that is really pushing it and not necessarily the individually mentally ill people sure. Sure. dealing with the issues. Sure. Well, I think that, that and, and um, uh, there is a, 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 a mental illness that we are all learning more about called dysphoria. Um, Bruce Jenner suffers from. Uh, gender dysphoria. Okay? Dysphoria is the belief that some part of your body is not actually a part of you. So you will find so, um, and and kind of more historically, that has that has been, you know, someone will believe it's kind of a kind of like um, if someone has a limb amputated, they will they will have kind of the residual feeling of that limb being there, okay? And there's a term for it which has just escaped me. Thank you. <laughs> I knew somebody would know that. And, and, and so in dysphoria, essentially, it's, it's kind of the opposite of that. It's this feeling that this, my left arm is a foreign object that has invaded my body and that it does not, it is not a part of me. And no matter how much I can see that it is connected, <laughs> my brain is telling me that this is not a part of my body. Okay? And that's a real good and that, thing. And that is a, and that is a very real, long-standing, diagnosed mental illness. It's called dysphoria. <laughs> and uh, and, and, the, and the, this is this has been dealt, dealt with for decades. Okay? Now, what we're kind of thinking, and what makes a case like gender dysphoria troublesome is that, it's not that it's a mental illness, but that 
that it, but that it interacts with so much of the political life of our country. So that we're not simply talking about uh, how to treat a certain mental illness. But now it becomes a matter of, okay, well what if I, you know, who's to tell me that I don't have the right to cut off my arm? My arm, I can do whatever I want. So I should be able to go to a doctor and say, I would like for you to cut off my left arm. Because I don't believe that it's really a part of my body and I feel like it's the fastest way for me to lose weight. <laughs> See, I'm getting ready for a vacation and you know how you have a so it's, it's, on, it's, it's on my mind, sorry. Um, so now the doctor is sort of faced with a dilemma because we have this whole realm of elective surgery, right? <laughs> that, that says, I don't think that this part of my body should belong here. Get rid of it. <laughs> and voila, liposuction. <laughs> right? And so, and it, which is not the same as dysphoria, don't mishear me here. But, but now the doctor has, a, uh, has a, an ethical dilemma, which is the patient wants this arm to be removed. And uh, the patient, in a, very much in our medical world, is the customer, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And the customer is always, right. therefore, <clears throat> should I, as a doctor, be able to legally remove this person's left arm because they asked me to? Well, for the doctor, Here's the uh, kind of the added pickle with this. The dilemma is that the doctor can look at this and say, this person is suffering from dysphoria. This is a mental, this is a mental illness. This is not a matter of, of truly of an elective surgery, but that there is a mental illness that needs to be treated. And if I treat this mental illness by cutting off their arm, I'm not actually treating the illness at all. Now I am, uh, now I am simply doing what the customer believes is right when they are quite literally not, do not have the mental capacity to make that decision because of this mental illness. Okay, so so we can look at that and think of it with the left arm. And, and kind of sort of recognize, well, clearly in that case, well, how is that different if you're talking about sexual organs? Well, now you have entered into the wild west of American politics. Because now those questions are not, are not centered around what is the proper treatment for this illness. Now the questions are centered around, um, around around uh, freedom to self-identify, and a whole host of other things that have almost nothing to do with what is the actual well-being of the person, but all kinds of stuff to do with the political climate of our country and all sorts of other stuff. Now, there are a few hands. We'll start with you, Isn't it really just the, the simple original sin that we all want to be God? Hidden behind, but it's my right. Um, I do think that there is a big part of us always that wants to that wants to self-determine, right? I want to be able to make my own decisions. You know, we are all two-year-olds by nature, right? I want to do it myself, and I don't want somebody else to tell me when or how or where. I shouldn't be able to do anything, and so that so that certainly is um, is the is a part of it, you know. And this I would I would argue is is kind of a part of the dilemma is that we want to be self determined, but we don't want to actually um, sort of face any consequences behind that self determination. So I would like to be able to. Uh, I would like to be able to self-identify as a very rich person, right? And so I am going to live as a very rich person who can buy the Maserati or whatever it is that I want, because I am the very rich person. Only my
my self-determination seems to conflict with Lisa's self-determination, <laughs> right? right. And, uh, and, and yet, I have been conditioned to believe that it is my inalienable right to be happy. And if those things are going to make me happy, or if lopping off my left arm or whatever else is what I want, then that's what I should be able to do. So for us, as a, as a Christian church, when we look at it, it is very interesting how much this, kind of what we know of the fall of Satan and then the fall and descent of Adam and Eve kind of parallels this exact story that is played out every day of our lives. You shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. God is holding out on you, and if you will only learn to make your own decisions for yourself, then you can be all that you want to be, and you won't need God or anyone else, because you can be your own God. Um, and so the, I think that the question for us as Christians is, How do we look at the, the Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenners of the world? Um, not with uh, not with a a sort of self righteous, um, you know, dumb dumb the nose at their you know, weirdness or perversity or whatever you want to call it. But how do we learn to look at to look at him and see a broken person that needs compassion. And that is, I would argue, also being plagued by every single person in the media for their own ends. Um, and, and that's where, for us as Christians, I would argue that we need to be able to look at that at the Ruth slash Caitlyn Jenner and say, um, Okay, so that is not my brokenness, maybe. It is, I don't know. That is not my brokenness. But I got plenty of my own. And they are no different. Not, not at the end of the day. And so, and, and what I need more than anything else is compassion. Truthfulness, but compassion. How do I learn how to give that compassion? Um, because they're... That their brokenness offends my brokenness, essentially. Does that make sense? I, I really, I, I think that we are going to be struggling with this so much in the next generation. It's going to be really, really tough. Uh, it's kind of I have a friend.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Thank you all. Of course, I can also find your hands.